um, welcome to session 5B. And um, we're going to be talking about all kinds of different aspects of food security today and growing. So um, a quick reminder before we get started that this session will be recorded. So if you don't wish to be on video, feel free to turn your camera off. Uh, my name is Kyra Wagner. I work with Homer Soil and Water Conservation District down here on the Kenai Peninsula, and I'll be moderating today. So please type any questions you have throughout the presentation in the chat, and um, please welcome our speakers. I'll let you take it away, honey. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, we have several folks on today that are gonna be presenting. I'll just do a quick intro. Um, I'm Heidi Rader with UAF Cooperative Extension Service and serving the Tanana Chiefs Conference region primarily. Um, we've also got Joanna Willingham from Johnny Seeds. She's gonna be talking all about um, you know, current availability and new varieties to try. We also have Ada Snyder with High Mowing Seed Company also talking about seeds to look out for, varieties and things. And Glenna Gannon, um, she is also with Cooperative Extension in the Agriculture and Forestry Experiment Station here in Fairbanks. And she will be talking about the vegetable trials we're doing here in Fairbanks. Um, and I think we're gonna go ahead and get started with Ada first up. Hey everyone. Um, I'm Ada Snyder and I'm with High Mowing Organic Seeds and I am the regional commercial grower representative and I get the privilege of working with farmers and growers in the northern, northwestern states. Um, so from Minnesota all the way over to Oregon and Washington and then up to Alaska as well. Okay, next page please. Does somebody have um, access to the presentation? Thank you. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> uh, these are basically uh, high mowings stats. Um, I think the big takeaways um, to, to know about high mowing is that we're an all organic seed company um, and we verify non-GMO as well. Um, we're based in Vermont, um, but we look for varieties that serve growers throughout the United States and, and Canada. Um, and have a, a wide range of varieties available. Okay, next slide. Okay, so um, today I'm gonna talk about the challenges um, in how seeds get to you in packets. And ultimately seeds are a labor of love. Um, seeds can travel a long way and make many stops along the way um, before you get those seeds in the packets that you're familiar with. And um, I'm gonna talk about the production part. So if you look at the nice little spiral, you'll see the production piece. Um, production happens with our vendors doing production. Um, high mowing also does seed production as we contract a good portion of our seeds um, with growers all over the United States. Okay, next slide. So in this next slide, we're gonna talk about challenges. <clears throat> And uh, you know, climate change, there's so many different ways that climate change is showing um, challenges to our productions and to our vendors' productions. Um, drought or even just having lack of access to water, um, higher, hotter temps, um, not just you know, in the regular time of the season where we're used to getting hot temps. Um, think hot temperatures happening in the early flowering stages. This happened with some tomatoes um, and it meant that it stalled production and meant that there was smaller harvest uh, available. Um, other things like smoke and um, slowing down the growth of plants. Um, those are all pieces of the climate change. Um, also measuring demand in advance. Um, COVID really challenged the seed world. Uh, 2020, everyone was very excited to uh, start their gardens, and then uh, farmers were even more in demand, um, producing uh, CSAs, other ways that folks could have access to produce. 
And what it did is it tapped into the reserves of seed and um, made it less of a carryover for the next season. And I'd say that both organic and conventional are working on replenishing the seed inventory right now. Um, recognizing blind spots, you know, some parent lines, some varieties, they're just not good seed producers. They may make a variety that we really love, but they don't make a lot of seed, which really challenges when everybody loves a variety and it doesn't make a lot of seed, which doesn't make sense to continue to produce it. Um, isolations are also a big deal. Uh, like I said, organic and conventional um, farmers, they're looking to replenish seed inventory. And so isolations are even less available. I apologize for the kiddos in the background. <laughs> Family life. Um, other challenges, um, pests and disease pressure. I think a lot of what farmers see in just growing produce, it happens in the seed world too. Um, some some quick thoughts, uh, aphids on kale, you know, um, if we don't get it on time with pyganic or other um, ways to get rid of aphids, it can be a crop loss. And uh, a good example is red Russian kale for us was a, a pretty big crop loss this year. Um, another challenge is ligus bug. Um, ligus bug is predating on carrot seed pretty heavily. And that's why you see beloved carrot varieties having um, less availability or even having lower germ. We're, we're noticing the same bug affecting other crops like cilantro. Um, and this is uh, an industry-wide challenge for sure. Um, disease, uh, powdery mildew. You know, we had a significant amount of powdery mildew on our purplet onion crop this year, which meant that we had very, very low yields on that crop. Um, and, you know, other pests, these are, I think, less common pests, but voles, they ate the badger flame crop. Those guys, they didn't, they must have really loved that. It, I'm sure it was tasty. Um, and the deer this year, they ate delicata squash, which they've never eaten before, um, but it was in a drought area. And so the deer had less um, available food to them. And so they went for the, the precious delicata seed. Um, other challenges is just a workforce. Uh, if there's not a workforce out there and if there is a workforce, um, they're definitely needing to get paid more than what they're getting paid. Um, and also there's just a backlog in, in quality control as we catch up from these last two years of just really taking as much seed as we can. That means that we're having to do larger seed productions and bring more seed in through the mill. And so our mill and our, our QC lab quality control, um, they get a little bit behind on doing all the, the testing and, and uh, making sure that everything is up to standards before it gets into packets. Okay, next slide. So what are some of our solutions? Um, we're doing multiple contracts with multiple growers, different sizes, so that we can really ensure that if you know, one grower has a challenge and there's less or no success on that farm, that we have other farmers that are producing that same variety and just making it more likely that we have a variety for the next season. Um, we're choosing varieties that are bred for the organic systems um, and, and have resilience in these times. So, more early seedling vigor, um, the ability to handle drier conditions, um, you know, all those challenges that come with organic farming, farming and just the environments that we're growing in these days. Um, we're also investigating seed production. So instead of figuring out that a variety doesn't have good seed production with um, a big contract crop, we'll do test productions and we work out contracts with those growers so that whether it's a um, uh, a win or a fail with that crop. Um, we get an understanding of how well a seed crop is gonna do, and then we can make sure that our growers have success. Um, and then a multiple year supply. We're almost always trying to do a two year supply. We've got growers um, all over the United States and Canada, and they need their seed at different times. Um, a good example are onions. Uh, California growers are typically planting their onions in October, but most onions are getting to warehouses in, say, February or January. And so making sure that we have enough seed to carry over so that it's just more fluidity and availability from year to year. 
And then in trials, we're, we're looking for multiple varieties that are going to fill a slot so that if one variety isn't available, we can work towards another variety and offering that so that hopefully it's just a little easier. And again, that fluidity of being able to produce um, the produce you need for your CSA, your farmer's market or, or wholesale. Okay, last slide. And I think what a lot of us are wondering is like, why do varieties disappear? Um, and they disappear for a lot of reasons, not just because of production challenges, um, but it could be poor sales. It could be poor sales. Um, it could even be a variety that high mowing and all of us really, really love, um, but our vendor just can't um, sell enough. Um, and, and it's just not available to keep alive. There's a lot of money that goes into breeding and developing a product. Um, and then sometimes it's replaced by a better variety. Um, and that can be to our benefit. Um, maybe it's because it's got disease resistance. Um, I think a good example is spinach. Spinach is often replaced a little bit faster than some other crops. And that's because of the, the ever-growing downy mildew races. Um, and then after there's again, quality control. So if something comes into us from a vendor and it has a low germination rate or um, has an off type in it, um, those are reasons why you may not see, see seed available in a season. So- All right, um, Ada, could you, could you say why the spinach is- Yeah, yeah. So um, spinach is dictated a lot by the California market. And in California, downy mildew is a huge disease pressure. And I'd say about every year, there is a new race of downy mildew. I want to say that we may be at race 17 um, at this point. And I'm sure that there are more. They just haven't declared or defined varieties that have that disease um, resistance. So yeah, downy mildew is a big, big piece for spinach. Okay, thanks. Our, our big issue up here, of course, is bolting and spinach. So. Yes, but, yes, uh, for sure. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. I bet. <laughs> Those long days will do it for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then my, my last slide is just my contact information. Um, so if you ever want to chat about varieties or would like to dive deeper um, onto insight of, about availability, I'm, I'm happy to do that. And uh, thanks for having me. Thanks, Ada. So I think, Joanna, you're up next. Hi. Hi, you guys. Um, my name is Joanna Willingham. I am your territorial representative for Johnny Selected Seeds. Um, that you can go on to the next slide. And I'm going to just be chatting a little bit about sourcing. Ada and I are covering some of the same topics. So I'm going to skip through some of these. Um, and we are both here to be your cheerleaders and to help you source as much as possible um, and find the best substitutions as possible. And um, Ada and I work pretty closely together in several other seed companies. So if we know how crucial a crop is for you, we'll try and help you find it elsewhere um, if we don't have a gap fill available. And we can go into more detail about that in a moment. This is um, just a quick blurb about who Johnny's, who we are um, at Johnny's. And um, we are 100% we are employee owned and we have um, been around since 1973. We're based out of Maine uh, and we have our large research farm there as well as many um, trial farms and partners across the country. Um, and I'll speak about trialing at the end of the presentation. Um, we offer um, we also have a commitment to our organics, um, and we have we have we were among the first um, company to sign the Safe Seed Pledge. So um, you can always source hundred percent certified organic, uh, as well as um, non untreated um, GMO free seeds. We will treat seeds for some of our conventional growers if they ask for it. That enhancement is available, but it comes to us raw, untreated, and or organic. So that is something that's slightly different than what high mowing has available, um, especially um, the pumpkin seeds in really moist 
areas tend, those are where the growers tend to ask for the treated seed more than anywhere else um, to fend off some of those climate um, issues that they're starting to see. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and this is just a picture about me. Um, I will, um, <laughs> we can come to that, that at the end. Um, and so I mentioned this basically when you're you're ordering with us we um we have a hundred percent satisfaction guarantee and we have warranties so um you are absolutely able to return things to us call us if you need technical assistance um we're here to set you up for success in any possible way we can um and we all and um we have over 150 new products this year um including a lot of varieties that have been trialed with many of our growers across um, the country um, to ensure the adaptability, to ensure that it's actually going to have the resilience that we expect in our seed production um, and our seed availability. Um, next slide. Um, I wanted to touch on shipping a little bit since the pandemic. Um, so we do, there are just a couple of things to keep in mind, some things that set us apart from um, other companies. We do offer free shipping um, if orders are over $200, but something to be aware of and something I'm work as, as someone who used to farm in Alaska for, for six years, um, I know how expensive um, it is to ship up to you guys and to just get the most basic things into your hands. And so I personally have been um, working with my logistics team to, to make things your lives easier. So free seeds are free to ship over $200. However, big, heavy, bulky, extra long items may come with a, a larger rate. Um, always give me a call. Um, right now, we're trying to streamline things to make it even less expensive for you um, as these rising costs are coming, are, are increasing um, and hitting us all from in a lot of different directions. Um, I can't always bring shipping down, but I work with my growers to find creative ways to bring other other ways, other prices down for you. Um, additionally, we have a partnership discount program and that's something I highly recommend. Um, if you are not a member of um, any farm organizations, there are a lot of um, membership programs out there that have things like, pro, it's kind of like a pro deal situation. So if you're a member of the National Young Farmers Coalition or the Farmers Union, there's a long list. Um, you could be saving anywhere from five to 10% off every order. So $10 annual membership fee will save you hundreds or thousands of dollars every year. Um, I am your Lee, I am your liaison. I'm your point person. If there is a partnership organization out there that has a membership that you think would benefit a lot of your Hawaii, um, excuse me, I was just in Hawaii, a lot of your Alaska growers, um, please let me know. Um, and I will advocate to create a specific discount program for all of you. Um, other ways to save on shipping are bulk discounts, and I mentioned that. So we can change the slide. I can get back into nitty gritty details about varieties. Um, some of the ways we're bringing predictability back to you. Um, Ada mentioned a lot of them um, in such a beautiful way with her um, pictures. <laughs> um, we, a lot of what we're doing right now is at, we have a similar vision um, as high mowing. We have reserves. We bring in as much as we can for um, multi years to ensure that we have substitutes in hand if we can't get that exact variety you want, we bring it in. We have agreements with all of our um, vendors. If we're not producing and breeding the seed ourselves, if it's not in our reserves, we have agreements that we have to, everyone um, is communicating now, giving us a year notice for any delays that come about. So that is one of the biggest ways we've been able to bring predictability back to you for your crop planning. Um, we've also added all of these dates to our website now. They are live and they're accurate. Um, and um, 
And as I mentioned, please reach out to me if you ever have questions. I'm here to work some magic from behind the scenes. If there's anything in reserves, I can check and see um, and get something for you. Um, additionally, Ada talked um, about the global and company, and company shortages and how we work together. So we can, we can move forward on the next slide. Um, and we can pass this one as well. Um, and last, uh, lastly, I wanted to speak a lot about trialing. Um, nothing goes into our catalog or out the door without field testing, trialing on our research farm, and then as well as with our farmers across the country. So typically, as a former trialer for Johnny's for many years, um, Ada did a beautiful job of mentioning the life of the journey of the seed. A lot of the breeds and the varieties can't take years to develop, and then it takes at least three years to trial them in the field to ensure that they still meet our standards. So um, I've been working, I work really closely with our my trial manager to select folks that would make um, really uh, really good trial partners with us. Um, we work closely with um, Heidi and several other people on this panel um, and a lot of other growers. There's no grower that's too small to be considered a trial grower with us. This is truly an opportunity for us to find out if it's going to work um, and if it doesn't, then it's just free seed for you and um, and and an opportunity to try something new. Um, please reach out to me if you're interested in becoming a trial grower. Um, we also have we're we've just begun to launch our trial tool program as well. Um, so some of my farmers in Alaska were able to try some um, biodegradable mulch. Um, and a couple of other um, fabrics recently. And we're excited to expand that to tools as well. Um, this is just beginning the And when I come to visit you all, I have a trial tool library um, that you can try out all of these new things that aren't even out there yet. So you can see what's coming. Um, and that's something that I, um, another way that we help you prepare your field. Um, and next slide, please. Um, and yes, this is my contact information. Um, uh, I believe Heidi and I are going to speak a little bit more about varieties together. I am here to chat with you about varieties and here to experience, um, help you with any technical questions you have. That's how you can find Thanks, Joanna. Me. That's very informative. And thanks for all your support for all of the, the villages and whatnot that you've worked with me on. Um, My pleasure. Next, Glenn is going to talk about the variety trials here in Fairbanks at the Agriculture and Forestry Experiment Station. Thanks so much, Ada and Joanna. You guys um, really did a beautiful job of setting the stage of uh, what, you know, what it is to um, provide seeds to growers and then also how they make it to us. And so um, I wanted to share a little, um, I guess, vignette of what we do uh, here in Alaska to then take that trialing a step further um, in order to provide um, you know, research-based information to our uh, producers. So that's anyone from the home gardener um, with pots on their deck up to farmers um, getting the information into their hands about what does well for our growing conditions. Oops. Um, so here in Alaska, you know, when I think, I think Joanna did a pretty good job of talking about um, what trialing is, and I'll just provide a little more context about why we trial here specifically in Alaska. So um, every, every growing condition, every growing environment uh, will have a different effect on how a particular seed, a particular crop um, develops and, and the characteristics that develop with it. And so here in Alaska, um, we're, we're doing this project funded by the USDA in order to trial varieties um, in part because we don't have a breeding program here in Alaska. Um, over the years, we have had a plant, plant breeder here in the past, but we don't currently. 
So we're using varieties that are developed outside of the state and then being grown here in relatively different conditions. Um, everything goes through a certain, as Joanna was describing, um, a certain level of rigorous trial before it ever gets released, which is great. And then we take it a step further to, to check out how it grows here. And part of the reason we're, we're doing that is because there's significant changes in our growing season um, you know, as we speak. So the Alaska hardiness zone maps um, that some of you might be familiar with is a USDA designation of um, what plants can grow in different areas. And um, you know, this, this map, I won't get too mired in the details, but these, these um, zones are based on coldest, um, coldest winter temperatures. So really that has more bearing on perennial plants perhaps than um, the, the annuals that we grow typically for our food crops here. But this garden tool and other tools that were developed by um, the UAF um, folks at SNAP or Sustainable Network for Adaptation. Oh, I'm gonna get the SNAP, look it up. Their, their website's below. Um, but, but they've created this sort of projection of what we might expect going into the future. Um, so that's one of the things that we're keeping an eye on. The other thing is, you know, the change in growing degree days. And this metric is um, really a measurement of the cumulative daily heat uh, for above a specific crop threshold. So in this case, we're looking at sweet corn over an entire growing season. And this metric is a little bit um, funky for Alaska, as, as Heidi and um, Joanna were talking about. We have long photo periods or, or growing days, right, with all of our sunshine, especially the further north you go. Um, so that, that has an effect that's not fully understood on the growing degree measurement. But if you look at just the general temperature trends, which is all that this graph is meant to do, since 1930, we've actually seen an increase of about 60% um, in growing degree days for sweet corn specifically. So again, it's crop specific, but here's just an example um, expressing why there are different crops that we can grow than maybe we did before. So I will, I'll be brief, but corn is one of those examples of back in the, I think it was 30s, Yukon Chief, maybe some of you are familiar with, was a uh, corn variety that was developed specifically um, at UAF for Alaskan conditions. Um, and when Heidi and I started these trials about five years ago, we found that Yukon Chief was really an unpleasant and not particularly um, productive corn, especially with when compared to some of the sweet corns um, like early sun glow, which is featured here, that we're able to grow now. Okay, so just quickly, uh, the experimental sites. So here's the Fairbanks um, Agriculture and Forestry Experiment Station farm. Those are our uh, research plots, or at least some of them in the um, photo on the right hand side. Um, we test uh, both in Fairbanks and Matanuska experiment station farms, and that's a north-south transect. So that gives us kind of a nice representation of um, what grows in two at least distinct uh, regions of Alaska. And with this new round of funding that I just received um, for the variety trials, we're hoping to um, grow out where the locational trials that we're doing in the state. So there's been some discussions about extending that onto um, the Kenai Peninsula, down into southeast, and I'm working with a producer up in um, Anaktuvik Pass to do some limited trials up there as well above the Arctic Circle. So how do we decide what to trial? Um, that, I feel like I'm missing some slides. Oh, no, I'm not. Okay, they're just out of order. So how do we decide what to trial? Um, largely through stakeholder engagement. So that means you, that means everyone that Heidi and I engage with when we do workshops um, out in rural communities or with you, the public, when you show up to a workshop. Um, ideally, we're, we're collecting some ideas and information from you. Um, and also we conduct a stakeholder survey every two years for the variety trials specifically. Um, so we did one in 2018, 2020, and that's right, we're due for one um, this year. And so uh, anyone here who grows plants is interested in growing plants, um, or your vegetables specifically, but we're also looking at adding some perennial, um, biennial, and fruit cultivars to our trials. So please take a moment and fill out that survey. Let us know what you're interested in seeing grown. You don't even have to grow anything. If you eat food and you want to eat more food grown in Alaska, take the survey. I'd love to hear from you. 
All right. And then um, just to give you an overview of what we've been trialing. So um, we're not uh, necessarily trialing on the scales that say Johnny's is where they have thousands of, of varieties of different crops being grown. Um, but we have been growing the capacity of the Alaska trials um, for the last five years and I continue to do so. So you'll see in 2021, uh, we really beefed up the number of crops that we're growing and within each of these crops we're growing anywhere from five to 20 varieties of each of those. So for example, for spinach, Heidi and I were interested in um, bolting. Heidi mentioned bolting. So we we're interested in which varieties were more bolt resistant up here in Alaska. So that that um, trial started in 2020 with 20, oh gosh, too many 20s, 22 different varieties of spinach in 2020. Um, and we've evaluated um, we will continue to evaluate how, how different spinach varieties do up here. Um, we're also adding crops in 2022. Um, so some storage onions, scallions, some leeks, uh, garlic, and some musk melons. So we've tried watermelons in the past with pretty limited success, but this year we're gonna try a few varieties of melons too. At the Palmer farm, those trials are um, a smaller subset of the trials that we do at the Fairbanks farm, largely due to um, human capacity as well as funding. Um, so we, and, and I'll just say resources in general, right? So our farm, um, we have a little more space at the Fairbanks farm. We also have um, two technicians and Heidi and myself are located in Fairbanks. And so in Palmer, we have a student horticultural technician running the down there with the aid of the farm staff and technicians there and they do a subset of the trials that we do here you'll notice that not all the same crops are trialed like corn for example or hot peppers and um, that's largely to do with environmental conditions so the matsu area gets a lot more wind than we do here in Fairbanks and so there's been problems with um, you know years we've done trials involving corn a windstorm will take out the whole crop so we've decided that that's not really an economically feasible crop to to trial at this time um, and then also we just have a hotter um, growing uh, growing season typically in Fairbanks. So things like hot peppers, like the melons, um, we'll sort of test those since they're right on the on the marginal edge of being productive up here in Alaska. Um, and Palmer will hold off uh, for a while or um, test them in high tunnels if and when we get there. So what do we do with this information? How do you get this information? Well, every year we publish a variety trial report um, and you can see an example of that here. Sorry, I'm trying to go fast. I know we're almost out of time. Um, please look at the link that Heidi's sharing where you can get that information and contact me um, if you have any questions about it. And then here's some generalizations, very general uh, for what has done well in Alaska. Um, you can get a copy of these slides or contact me or look at that report to get all of this information for yourself. Um, and we're hiring. So um, please take a screenshot of this really quick. And also we'll share the links, um, but both in Fairbanks and Palmer, we're hiring for our summer research technician team. So please check that out if you're interested or know anyone who is. Um, we hire both student employees, um, specifically in Palmer has to be a student, but also in Fairbanks, um, anyone with some good experience. So um, don't hesitate to get in touch if you're interested or know someone who is. And Heidi, I'll hand it off to you. <laughs> okay. Um, I think we're about out of time, but I'm glad you guys shared all of that great information about varieties and the trials. Um, I shared a bunch of links in the chat and that's kind of what I was gonna share about is just how we get the word out about variety trials. Um, but I don't wanna to cut too much into the time for the next person. So I'm just gonna say thank you Big thank you to Joanna and Ada for joining us and sharing all of your wealth of information. Um, and I'm gonna say, I was gonna talk a little bit about exciting flowers to grow. Um, and you can find some more information on that at the It Grows in Alaska blog soon, soon to be out. So, as well as a bunch of other information on growing and gardening um, here in Alaska. So, um, I'm going to wrap it up at that point and hand it off to the next speaker, um, Kira. All right. Thank you very much. Um, uh, that was very informative. Thank you all for um, supplying us with all that information and your contact information. I'm sure we'll uh, continue. Um, 
like right now, I would like to introduce Leah Wagner, our very own seed company here in Alaska, Found Root Seeds. Um, so welcome. Um, it, it may take me, take me a second to get everybody's um, video situated, but welcome Leah and uh, go ahead and get started. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes, you sound great. Okay. <laughs> Um, am I going to be able to share my screen? Yes, you should be able to. Okay. Perfect. Okay. All right. There we go. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Leah Wagner. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I gratefully and thoughtfully reside within the rightful lands of Glinkinani. I'm the co-founder of Foundroot. We're a small family-owned company operated solely by my husband and I. Um, we specialize in open pollinated seeds proven for northern gardens and supplies that support a self-sufficient lifestyle. I'll be talking a little bit more about us later in the presentation and ways we'd love to connect with you more. Um, as you can see, I ask that any materials taken from this presentation be used for personal use only. I have a lot I want to share with you, so this is going to be kind of fast and furious. P please feel free to take those screenshots. Um, I'll take um, clarifying questions. Um, so Kyra, if you could interrupt me if there's um, clarifying questions in the chat during the presentation, but um, feel free to pop any questions into the chat box and I'll try and address everything at the end or message you directly. Um, I'm gonna start by working through a timeline on the corporatization of seed and the laws enacted that brought us to the situation that we're in today, focused on the United States. Um, my hope is to offer tools that you can use to bring others into this conversation. I'd like to acknowledge that this is a really big conversation and there's many things I won't be addressing today. Um, my knowledge is limited to that of a farmer, not a scientist nor a scholar who's done research to inform myself as I've taken this on as my cause, my passion and what I've personally dedicated my work and life to. Prior to the timeline I'll be addressing is that of the first peoples of this land and so many other lands. Um, this is a story and a country built on enslavement, displacement, and on seeds. Seeds that were traded with and taken from the indigenous people that then sustained the colonizers who came to their land. Profound racism and marginalization is the foundation of what I'll be talking about today. And when we empower ourselves and reclaim this narrative, when we save our seeds, when we rematriate seeds that aren't ours, when we restore ancestral seeds to their indigenous homes, we're fighting against a very deep oppression. We're restoring invaluable cultural and religious traditions, resilience, community, and the dignity that resides in all of these things. So thanks for being here with me today. Um, all right, here we go. In 1839, the U.S. didn't really have a seed industry. Uh, it was really common knowledge how to save and store seeds, and this was done mostly by farmers independently. 75% of the U.S. economy was agriculturally focused at this time, and the U.S. Patent and Trade Office established an agricultural division and began distributing free seeds to farmers across the country. Um, in 1862, the USDA was established and they devoted a third of their budget to taking over this program and collecting and distributing free seeds to farmers across the country. They encouraged seeds to be collected from around the world and um, seed research was publicly funded at this time. In 1897, the seed program had an annual distribution of over 1 billion seed packets. Um, seed rates weren't an issue until the seed industry really took hold. So seed companies at this time were uh, mostly distributors, they weren't really producers. Um, there's a few things that kept this um, in the public commons. There was the 1862 Morrill Act and this established land grant universities and they were um, doing a lot of breeding and growing seed at this time. And then the 1887 Hatch Act is how we got our experimental research stations. And this was how we were getting seeds out to communities. Prior to this, um, it was actually like individual congressmen that were sending it out to its constituents. So, um, unfortunately, after 40 years of lobbying, the American Seed Trade Association um, of privatized industry succeeded in convincing Congress to cut this program. Um, professionals argued that the privatization of seed would foster greater food security. So seeds up until this point were predominantly open pollinated seeds. Um, these are natural breeding methods you can do right at home. It has immediate seed saving potential. Um, these at this time are our heirlooms. So, 
all heirlooms are open pollinated seeds, but not all open pollinated seeds are heirlooms. Heirlooms are gonna be our seeds with a story. Um, in 1930 is when we see the first governmental oversight in the ownership of plant materials. So this is the Plant Patent Act, and this allowed intellectual property protection of asexually propagated plants. So these are going to be our fruit trees, our rose bushes. We're not talking about seeds or tubers quite yet. Um, but with this newfound protection, um, this led to an exponential growth in the hybrid seed industry. So hybrid seeds are created by crossing two inbred genetic lines um, to create a superior seed variety. This um, takes a lot longer than open pollinated seeds and it doesn't have immediate seed saving potential. So with our hybrid seeds, um, when you collect seeds from that pepper or tomato, it's not necessarily going to represent the parent plant. Um, so initially these hybrids were being developed by those land grant universities who wouldn't give private seed companies exclusive rights to those seeds. But after the seed distribution program was eliminated, this changed. Open pollinated seeds were not as good for business. So in 1957, we see a real shift in how our country is approaching agriculture. We get the term agribusiness for the first time. And in the 1960s, we see large seed companies beginning to buy up smaller seed companies. We're seeing a very different farming industry at this time much larger plots of land, bigger machinery. These hybrid seeds allowed for um, much more consistency. These crops are gonna be in uniform size. They're gonna have the same harvest times and that allows us to bring in these machines. By 1965, over 95% of American corn acreage was planted with hybrid seed. So the corn industry really took this on full fold um, once that became more popularized. With this, we also see an exponential increase in the use of pesticides, herbicides, and chemical fertilizers. So in 1952, about 11% of our corn crops were treated with herbicides. By 1982, this had risen, risen to 95%. Um, so just recap, hybrid seeds meant a lot of larger companies buying out smaller ones. Seed companies started breeding their own seeds. Um, we get a lot more uniform product and we kind of fall into a more industrial agricultural industry and increased chemical usage because of that. In 1970, we get the PVP Act, and this really changes the game. So these are patents given by the USDA, and this gives breeders up to 20 years of exclusive rights over plant materials. This extends those patents to the seeds and tubers that weren't protected before. And then as of the 2018 Farm Bill, it actually includes those asexual reproduced plants as well. So again, those fruit trees, those um, rose bushes. Um, this is a lot easier to get than a utility patent, which I'll be addressing in a little bit. Seed saving is still legal for personal use and research purposes, just not for sale. So farmers can save seed, reuse them, but they can't sell that seed. Um, I just want to note that this created a pathway for legalized open pollinated seed theft um, actually around the world. And so corporate breeders with this can go into communities, they can collect seed, they can select them for a couple of years, make some very minor changes, and then claim that they discovered those seeds. Um, if you haven't paid for a license, someone else can claim ownership over your ancestral seeds, um, and then you have to get permission to use them. So in 1980, things deeply changed with the landmark court case of Diamond versus Chakrabarti. Um, genetic engineer Mohan Chakrabarti, uh, Ananda Mohan Chakrabarti was working for General Electric and he developed a bacterium that could break down crude oil. Um, this was proposed um, to be treated in uh, oil spills actually, and they wanted propri proprietary rights over that. Um, this guy, uh, Chief Justice Berger, concluded that Congress had intended patents to include anything under the sun that was made by man. So this is later clarified in 1985 and 2001 for um, in some further court cases, and it allows utility patents to pl be placed um, on life forms. So before a plant, an animal, or a breeding method could be owned, but the actual genetics of it could not. So this covers whole plants, plant parts, derivatives, non-naturally occurring genes, traits, breeding methods, useful applications. It is the strongly, strongest and most costliest, very versatile type of intellectual property rights. And there's no exception in this for breeding research or for personal seed saving. So it actually 
can criminalize and punish traditional seed saving. Technically, if they choose to go after you, your harvest, your equipment used, storage facilities, and land could all be seized that you grew that seed on. Um, farmers have to sign contracts. They have to pay annual royalties to seed companies just for using their seed if it has a utility patent on it. So essentially with this, seeds have the exact same rights as a toaster. Um, this is directly correlated to um, how we got our genetically modified seeds. So GM seeds are going to have had their DNA engineered in a laboratory. This is not something we're gonna be doing at home. It can include splicing in genetic material from other scientific kingdoms, not just plant kingdoms. And immediately after um, Diamond versus Chakrabarti, um, 1800 patents on life forms were issued. All of a sudden, companies that historically had no interest in agriculture, including chemical and pharmaceutical firms, began purchasing seed companies. So um, we see in 1996, Roundup Ready soy being introduced. Um, Roundup Ready is a proprietary name uh, for a glyphosate herbicide, which um, was classified as a known carcinogen in 1985, but then was declassified in 1991 as um, Roundup was being developed. So now more than 80% of all GM crops grown worldwide have been engineered for herbicide tolerance. The use of glyphosate has increased 15 fold since GMOs were first introduced. So there's a very intrinsic link to how we farm and what we're farming by the seeds that we're using. Um, this also um, directly related to the ownership of seeds. So like I said, there was a lot of larger companies taking over those smaller ones. And what that resulted in is now four biochemical companies controlling over 75% of plant breeding research and they own over 60% of the global seed sales, which is estimated to be worth $92.35 billion by 2025. Um, this chart has been um, worked on many times over. Dr. Phil Howard of Michigan State University has done extensive research on the concentration and monopolization of our food industry. So there were nearly 400 ownership changes involving these firms in the last 23 years. And this peaked in 1998 after um, this landmark case. And one of the ways this relates to us the most is that in 2005, um, as home gardeners, is that Monsanto, um, one of the big players that has since been bought out, um, it bought a company called Semenis, and Semenis controlled approximately 40% of the US vegetable seed market and 20% of the world market um, at that time. So in 1996, there were about 300 independent seed companies in the US, but by 2009, there were fewer than 100. Um, this trickled down into our home gardens because um, companies that we really trusted had all been sourcing Semenis. Some of them took a political stance against this acquisition, which led to a re revitalization in small seed companies. Um, I also want to note that China now has two seed firms ranked in the top 10 of global seed sales, ChemChina and Longping High Tech. So if your seeds don't say that they're grown in the U.S., there's a possibility that they're not, um, even if you're shopping with a U.S. company. So um, in... 80 years, we lost about 93% of the diversity, diversity in the catalog seed supply. Um, this is a really incredible National Geographic chart that shows this representation of loss um, from 1903 to 1983. It's a massive amount of genetic erosion that happened. Um, and this is really relevant for Alaskans in particular, because we live in a climate that is not as common for um, the vast majority of our country. And so when most people want the sweetest tomatoes, we just want the tomatoes that can actually grow. And um, we have lost a huge amount of the seeds that would be viable for a climate like ours. So what are we going to do about it? Um, one thing we can do is that we can ask for full patent disclosure and help keep seed in the public commons. Um, there's an amazing number of resources that offer ways to stay connected on this issue. So the Open Source Seed Initiative 
um, started in 2012, and they were founded to breed seeds that will always stay in the public commons. They have a logo. You can look for their logo marked OSSI in seed catalogs, and also just looking for open pollinated seeds in general. Um, the Patent Watch through the Organic Seed Alliance and just the Organic Seed Alliance in general is an incredible resource. Um, the Patent Watch started in 2020, um, and they have an email list. You can get updates. You can get calls to action. Um, the Seed Savers Exchange does an annual yearbook. They're also um, a nonprofit seed company that's focused on heirloom seeds and plants. But when you become a member and you get their catalog, you can contribute to it. And you can also source seeds from all over the world. It's pretty much just like this epic seed swap. Um, and this is also a way to catalog seeds to help prevent those utility patents from being possible. Um, the non-GMO project relates more to the food that we eat. Um, this is a labeling and testing project. It has a free app that you can get just to be aware of companies that are trying to avoid GM seeds. Um, the Convention on Biological Diversity was started in 1993. This is a UN agreement that countries signed on to to protect national sovereignty over biodiversity. Um, we are the only UN member state that hasn't ratified the treaty. So this is also something to be aware of. Grain is a small nonprofit. Um, it's a Spanish NGO, and they have a bunch of great resources on their site, and that's focused a lot more internationally. Um, Navdanya uh, started the Global Movement for Seed Freedom. This is Vandana Shiva's organization. She is an incredible seed steward um, and activist, and this was started 30 years ago to protect our seed diversity and farmers' rights. India has a particularly interesting history around these, and so it's definitely worth um, looking into to see how they've been um, dealing with these issues over the years. And then the Global Coalition of Open Source Seed Initiatives, the OSSI is part of this, um, but that's just a more internationally focused one. Um, this is a photo that I found of David Wilcox. He's 15 uh, in this photo, and he and his family are from Sitka, and they actually ran from California to New Jersey to raise awareness about GMOs. I thought that was cool. So um, you can also use your purchasing power for good by buying open pollinated seeds from regional seed companies. Ultimately, when you purchase seeds, the choices you make are defining whether you believe seeds are a commodity or if you believe that they're a right. Um, this is a very cursory list of some of the folks that we love and support, um, and some of which we source our seeds from or have been able to access farmers to source our seeds from through. Um, so yeah, definitely take a screenshot of this. And then, um, of course, save your seeds. After putting together this presentation, I realized how much I had to say and how little time I gave myself to say it. Um, so I realized that a seed saving specific class is probably in order and I haven't taught one yet this year. So if that's something that you're interested in, get in touch and we can definitely schedule it. Um, if you are gonna save your seeds, um, there's a few different questions that you wanna ask yourself. Just understanding these plants and how they produce seed is really um, critical before you get started. So when is that seed produced? Are you cracking open that seed in the first year or in the second year? Because that second year is pretty challenging in Alaska. We're either overwintering in the ground or in a root cellar. And, um, and that's gonna determine uh, that seed saving potential. You also wanna know how these seeds are pollinated. If you live in a really rural area, um, it might not be an issue, but if you're around other home gardeners, things that are wind pollinated are gonna be pretty problematic. Insect pollinated, there's lots of ways to deal with it. You can, ca um, you can cage your plants, you can do hand pollinating, um, and it's a little bit easier to work with. And then what type of flower um, does your plant have? Does it have a perfect flower or an imperfect flower? And those perfect flowers are gonna be our easiest seed savers. Um, they have the male and female parts within the same flower. And so um, they're a lot less likely to get cross pollinated and then your seeds will grow true to type. Um, so these are just some easy veggies for beginner seed savers. Um, I know tomatoes and peppers are tough in Alaska, but um, if you can do them, you're immediately breeding a challenging plant for our climate that is going to be more adapted. And so if you get, you know, any tomato, that tomato is already going to be slightly bred for your conditions in your garden. And especially with tomatoes, they have a lot of genetic material in each fruit. And so you can get pretty far um, with doing seed saving on a home scale. Uh, so yeah, definitely take a screenshot of this. And then these are some resources. Um, I think we have the seed garden and breed your own vegetable varieties in stock right now, but we can get the other ones for you if you're interested. 
Um, the Seed Garden is my personal favorite. It's a pretty big book. It has beautiful photos um, and it has a lot of vegetables that are really relevant for Alaska. Seed to Seed is the older version of this essentially, in my opinion. Um, it's more of a reference guide. It's awesome, um, but it doesn't have any photos and it's just kind of text. Um, so if you want something smaller, uh, cheaper, um, but without um, the bells and whistles. And then the organic seed grower and breed your own vegetable varieties are an amazing resource if this is something that you want to do potentially on a farm scale or you want to move um, into this in a really serious way. Uh, the last one's just a small pamphlet. It's by my friend and, ben and mentor, Bill McDorman. Um, I don't carry this one because it's not as relevant for Alaska, but it's five bucks. I believe Siskiyou Seeds has it in stock right now. And so if you um, are interested in just getting a tiny little primer, um, this is a great one to start with. So, create and support seed libraries. We have some incredible seed libraries in our state. I believe Saskia Esslinger in Homer is me talking about the one she's starting later today, which is really, really cool. Um, these are our regional seed banks. So um, here are some photos that I found of different seed libraries and ways that you can do it. These are they're, they're usually run out of libraries and they try and function like a library. So you check out your seeds, you, you grow them, you save some of those seeds and then you put them back. Um, these are the ones that I really wanna see. I believe this is actually in the Atlas Mountains of Morocco, um, but I wanna see refrigerated seed banks, um, seed libraries, and I wanna see them in glass. So those seeds last a really long time. And so if, um, if, you, if you're gonna do packets so people can take them home, you can stick them in glass jars. And um, yeah, I would love to see more uh, seed libraries have refrigeration. Um, and then once you're saving those seeds and you're stocking them in your local seed banks, um, you're gonna swap them. And seed swaps are often, um, this is this is one that we hosted a really long time ago. They are they're often like our old seeds or the seeds that didn't really work for us or something that we just didn't use all of. Like that's not really what we want to be doing with seed swaps, right? We want to be growing those seeds. We want to be adapting them to our area. And then we want to be sharing them. Uh, the other photo is probably the best seed swap I've ever been to. It's actually at a class called Seed School. Um, and these are incredible seed stewards from all over the country. And these are special varieties that they had been breeding that they were swapping around. And so um, you don't have to grow everything and you don't have to, um, you don't have to grow all the veggies. You don't have to grow all the seed. You just have to grow some and do it well and then share with your friends and your neighbors and your community. And then, um, and then you can all enjoy that wealth. Um, we wanna be available to you as much as possible. Um, we've been around for 10 years and we're here to connect and collaborate um, and support your seed saving efforts. Um, this is Foundroot's mission. We are dedicated to building food sovereignty and resilient Northern communities however we can. Um, we donate hundreds of seeds every year to teachers, community groups, um, school gardens. We um, generally don't charge for education and we give talks um, as much as we can manage. Again, it's just my husband and I, um, but we really try. And, um, and there's all different ways that we can work together to help bring more of this into fruition. And we love working with other organizations and businesses. In 2015, we moved to Haines, Alaska with the express purpose of starting, these are just some of the projects that we've supported in the past. Sorry, I skipped that slide. Um, with it, we moved to Haines, Alaska with the express purpose of starting a seed farm. Um, this is our home plot where we have about a quarter acre garden. Um, and our goal was to breed seeds for Alaskan region. And we moved to Haines because we believed it was the best climate to do this work. Um, we grew um, food because there's a huge need for that in our community. And then we also produce seed. Um, and we had, um, we were gearing up to have about a an uh, acre cut. Um, and we were really proud of the work that we did for four years. But unfortunately, this last spring, um, we were prevented from growing on the land where we had started our farm. And so we're in the process of moving our farm, which is um, a big endeavor. But um, my husband's going to be talking about that during the lightning talks at 3.30. And we're really, really excited about um, what we're about to hopefully do. Um, so that was a lot. <laughs> And I appreciate you listening and being here with me. Um, I guess the only last thing I want to say is that 
these are cheap and they're small and they can go out to people all over. We're really proud of the fact that we've since seized over 70 different communities, many of which are incredibly remote in our state. Um, every packet of seeds we send out has infinite potential to make uh, fresh food more accessible um, to people who might not have had access to it otherwise. If it's not affordable, it's not sustainable. And gardening is a legitimate and critical part of our food system. Seed saving, using local inputs, um, building community-wide systems has the potential to make fresh food free um, for the people who need it most. And so we are looking for farmers who want to grow seed for us. Um, we, um, in our in the grab bags for this event, we put in crest seed that we sourced from Grow North Farm. Um, these are really beautiful seeds that were brought to Alaska by uh, Nepali refugees that are farming there now. Um, and we have low minimums. You don't have to grow a lot. Um, we'll pay a premium and we want to be a vehicle for income potential for projects that might need it. Um, you can also wholesale from us and sell our seeds if that's a good fundraiser for you. Um, and we just, yeah, we want to teach more seed saving. We want to be able to support all these different efforts. Um, the further down the road we get that we've already been on, um, the cooler the seeds are that we're going to be growing, the more useful and important they're going to be for Alaska. So please keep in touch. Thanks. Thank you so much. That was a ton of information, <laughs> uh, but ex extremely spot on. So thank you so much, Leah. Um, uh, we are um, going to uh, right, you hit right at time as well. So we don't have a lot of time for questions. I noticed that the indigenous, um, uh, where did it go on that? Um, there's a lots of things. I encourage you to look at the chat. Maybe you can answer some of those things. But um, uh, there were some references to other um, seed saving uh, groups that you could work with, um, as well as questions about your farm. Like you said, you're going to talk about that this afternoon. But um, yeah, so much going on out there. You know, I have a call in with you already to talk about seed saving <laughs> with my organization. So thank you for doing what you do. Um, now we're going to switch gears. And um, I am going to introduce uh, Emily Garrity. She is going to be bringing us right straight onto the farm and introducing us to a number of uh, tools for um, uh, the farm. Take it away, Emily. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Kyra. And holy cow, Leah, that was so much great information. Thank you. Thank you so much. Cannot wait for my first seed saving class with you. Looking forward to that. So I'll be in touch for sure. Um, okay, let me do all the things here. Share my screen. Oops. Share sound. Okay. Okay. How are we looking so far? Looking good, it's coming up. Looking good, okay. Um, you know what, actually, okay. Okay, well, thanks Kyra again for the introduction. Um, like she said, I'm Emily Garrity and I'm the owner and operator of Twitter Treat Gardens outside of Homer. And to, today I'm gonna talk about how we've incorporated specialty tools to increase efficiency on our market garden. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick trip down memory lane before we get into the topic, just so you can kind of get an idea of where we started and to where we are today. So I moved to Homer in 2003 with uh, a big dream of being a farmer. I moved here hoping to get a farm job. I left one in Fairbanks that I dearly loved at basically Basil, um, but longed to move to Homer. So came here um, with a dog and a pickup truck and 50 bucks in my pocket and hoped to land a farm job, but quickly realized that in Homer at that time, there weren't any farms hiring. Um, so I thought, well, you know what, I'll just go off on my own and, and try to start one. So I was able to borrow a small plot of land on the Homer bench um, in 2004, and I put in a thousand square foot garden and sold four CSA shares. 
And then in 2005, I was able to move on to what is now Twitter Creek Gardens. Um, spent the first couple of seasons working on building a house and trying to figure out the land. And in 2007, put in about a quarter acre garden, sold maybe 11 CSA shares. In 2008, uh, started working an entire acre and then slowly built up from there. Uh, that picture from 2018 is pretty close to what we have now in 2022. So I started off um, the way that I think a lot of farmers start off young. Um, I took the route where I just invited people to come up to work the farm with me. I, I didn't have a ton of experience yet and I was very much in the learning stage and our fearless Alaska Food Policy Council leader there, Robbie Mixon, came up independently of her now husband, Chaz, um, to work on the farm with me for a season. And they were offered a $350 a month stipend and modest accommodations that little snapshot picture is our sauna that I transformed into a bunkhouse for Robbie. And um, again, I didn't have a ton of experience. So the arrangement was really like, come up, live and eat and work with me. We're going to eat beans and rice every single day and work super hard and have fun um, and hope for the best. So they came up in 2011. This was our first farm crew. And we kind of started from there up to what we are today. Um, so this is a picture from, you know, I'm missing a slide, but I'm just gonna go with it. So this is a picture from 2021. Um, and this is kind of what we what our farm looks like now. We have an acre and a half outdoor garden, uh, passive, solar, passive solar greenhouse, all kinds of tunnels, uh, wash and pack house, a root cellar, um, a wood shop, and so on and so forth. Our avenues of sale, our 95 member CSA, we sell to restaurants, we sell wholesale to grocery stores. Um, we sell, we vend twice a week at the Homer Farmers Market, and we also vend through the Alaska Food Hub. I I'm gonna Emily, do you have a, a box open or something um, that is covering in front of your slides? Let me look because we let's skipped a bunch of hold on a second. Huh. Is it you can't you can't see my screens? Oh I can I can see your screens, but we also have a black box that's covering up a corner of your presentation. It looks like another window might be open or something. Huh. Okay, sorry about that. Let me no um, it's not detrimental, but if you can find it, then it would be good. But okay. It might just be a glitch. Is that I I, can't, I don't see it anywhere. Do you think we can work with this? Yep, yep, it works <laughs> okay. fine. <laughs> sorry. Um okay, let me see. Where was I? Okay, 2021. Here we are. So I just want to point out that um, we just have, you know, an acre and a half in a fence. So every inch of space is really super important. Uh, we don't have enough room to turn a tractor around. You can kind of see, um, you know, we are cultivating from fence line to fence line. So the way we do it is we use a BCS walk behind tractor and an arsenal of hand tools. Um, and we really work all of our beds with the broad fork. So we are not a no till, but a minimal till bio-intensive market garden. That's kind of how I describe us. So we keep a really rigorous uh, weekly schedule. And I wanna point out that we try to take Sundays off because that downtime for us is super important. Um, we just have to do animal chores, you know, and then hopefully have enough downtime for the day to rejuvenate, to hit the ground running full on uh, Monday and continue through the week. So with all of those markets that we're trying to accomplish, um, the prepping the land, sowing seeds, harvesting, washing, packing, and deliveries take up, you know, all of our time. But we do, we have been able to work up from what we used to work maybe 16 hours a day to, you know, a typical eight to five um, schedule for the whole crew for the most part. So just a snapshot of our crew. Um, there's four of us that work here on the farm. Two of us are full-time. Allison, who will be returning for her ninth year, is a salaried employee. Myself, I also work full-time. And then we hire two hourly wage employees um, that work four days a week. And our starting 
uh, wage for 2022 is $15 an hour. And I just put these labor costs out there because we started with, you know, stipends in 2011 where everybody got $350 a month and the full labor cost was $5,000, you know, for the season to where our labor costs in 2021 were over $40,000. And I point this out because I think money is a really important piece um, of farming and it's not talked about in my opinion enough and i'd say that most beginning farmers come to me and ask me you know how how can i afford to be a farmer and i feel like i have um a good story of how you know i started off with very little money but had a lot of support and a lot of grants and a lot of farm service agency loans and slowly have been able to build up the farm to what it is today and be able to afford to pay myself and a crew um, close to a living wage. Um, so some of the keys that have been able to uh, make this happen for us throughout the years is we do all of our planning in the winter. Um, we create our season calendar in the winter months. We hire our crew early on. The goal is to get to a returning crew um, 100%. This year we have two people returning and we've hired one new crew person on with the potential of hopefully being having a long-term commitment that was pitched uh, during the hiring process. We have all of our markets established. We schedule our downtime throughout the season. Um, Allison and myself each get a mid-season break because we're, you know, the the full-time plus employees on the farm. And the key to all of this is really being efficient. So that brings us into the topic that I wanted to talk about today, which is incorporating specialty tools um, to increase the efficiency on our market garden. In 2018, I received a specialty crop block grant and the project title was increasing crop production efficiency and yields with innovative technology. And I pitched the grant as, um, you know, an opportunity to show a demonstration farm specific to Alaskan producers. I found like, you know, many of us as farmers have probably found there's a tremendous amount of hurdles to being Alaskan farmers. Some of them um, lack of access to mentors, lack of access to be able to trial equipment before paying all of the shipping costs to get it to Alaska to trial on our farms. Um, obviously the expensive shipping rates and our, you know, sloping lands, um, harsher weather conditions, and of course the, shorting gro the shorter growing season. So in the grant, I pitched that we would purchase some of these specialty tools, um, trial them on our farm, document the efficiency and the labor saving. Oh, I just got a pop up. Hopefully you can still see my screen. Is everybody with me here? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the pop ups confuse me. Okay. Um, yeah, document our efficiency, trial and demonstrate these tools and our demonstrations are through on-site workshops as well as through a series of online videos. So the grant funds paid for all of these things and uh, we're just now getting to the end of that grant period. We had a year extension because of COVID. So I'm gonna go through just some of the tools that we purchased with the grant funds. Um, and we wanted to pitch our grant to emphasize tools that went through the entire growing season with us. So everything from bed preparation into post harvest handling. So I'll start um, with the silage tarps. Um, and here's something that I've learned. Silage tarps work. I have had many people approach me and say, well, what if I just go buy a black tarp at the hardware store? Well, in my experience, you know, getting for the right tool for the job is super important. And over time is gonna save you money. So your black tarp might break down in the matter of two years from sun rays and fray on the edges and you're gonna be messing with it in the wind um, and overly be annoyed. And all of that's gonna end up in the landfill in two years. And then you're gonna go back and buy another black tarp and, and you know you buy a couple of those and you've already paid for a silage tarp. It doesn't go in the landfill and really works. So. Um, here's some costs. We got ours from Farmer's Friend LLC. Here's some of the sizes and the costs for those just for a snapshot. And <clears throat> the way we use them is we do our best to keep tarps on prepared growing beds from anywhere uh, from three to six weeks. So our method is to prep our entire garden in as early as spring as possible. And then we tarp all of our succession beds 
right away. So some of our succession beds, you know, only have a tarp on them for about two weeks and we peel them back. And so our salad greens, for example, and there might be a little bit of weed pressure. And then 10 days later, we plant our next succession crop and there's a lot less weed pressure. And then 10 days later, we peel back tarp yet again, and there's absolutely no weed pressure. So this, um, picture here, you can see our salad green beds have absolutely no weeds in them, which is the goal, especially for such tightly, uh, densely spaced crops. So in order to prepare our beds, like I said before, we use um, a broad fork and then we follow with a BCS walk behind tractor. Here's two of the tractor attachments that we use to prep our beds. Um, the flail mower, we in the fall go through and mow all of our old big brassica crops and all of the vegetation. And I love this implement because it just pulverizes all of the vegetation and, and puts it right back into the growing bed. So there's no lugging tons and tons of plants um, off of the growing beds and all of that nutrients you know, that you've grown into these plants are going right back into the soil. And we also use the flail mower between succession crops. So as soon as we're done harvesting our salad greens, then we'll come through flail mow, pulverize, um, add our compost and our natural amendments, and then we'll go with the power harrow, um, which just has a stirring motion. So it's only working the top three inches of the bed, really keeping our soil structure and our mo microbial life happy. And that power harrow also has that seed roller bed to prep for a perfect um, seeding surface. And that's the point where we cover it with our silage tarps. So next up um, is a quick click drop seeder and we use this in our greenhouse nursery. It's super slick and super simple. Um, it is expensive, I'd say for, you know, a startup cost, but for us, it's been able to pay for itself really easily over the course of one season. So here's a time trial we did. Um, what used to take us about three and a half minutes to hand seed a 264 cell paper pot chain um, just takes like a click, you know, less than a second or just a couple seconds to seed that entire tray. So it's super slick. And when you're planting hundreds and hundreds of cell trays, um, you know, over the course of the season for us, that saves about a week in, in one person's labor or uh, saves us about a week of labor costs, I should say. Um, next is the paper pot transplanter. Um, this is hugely effective at the transplant stage. And we use the paper pot transplanter for all of our crops that are spaced four and six inches apart. Um, you can also get those paper pot chains for two inch spacing, but anything that we're gonna um, plant in two inch spacing, we're gonna direct seed. So for us, um, we use the paper pot transplanter for scallions and lettuce and beets, um, spinach, full size Asian greens, kohlrabi, some onion varieties. And this year we're gonna trial uh, rutabagas and maybe turnips. But for the time, tri the time trial that we did, we did um, a spinach crop. And in our standard 80 foot by 30 inch bed, we plant four rows of spinach, um, four inches apart. So that's a total of 960 plants per bed. And what used to take, you know, two people, um, one and a half hours each. So a total labor time of three hours with the paper pot transplanter takes one person 30 minutes. So um, there's, there's kind of a time trial graph and some of the information to show that it is an expensive, you know, upfront cost, but over the course of the season for us, it, it, it easily paid for itself. So I'm just gonna stop my video quickly here and show you this little uh, video of the paper pot transplanter in action. Hopefully this will play. It's pretty slick. It digs the furrow, um, unravels the cell chain, plants the lettuce plants, and then it has little feet in the front there that cover them up and boom, those are all planted just by dragging that mechanism. So pretty dang slick. Um, I will mention that I don't think that I would recommend this for a home gardener or for, you know, a half acre or less plot of land. I think that economy of scale kind of, you know, builds up. It really makes sense for our size, acre and a half, and probably, you know, between five, 
between acre and a half and five acres before you get into like a tractor farmer situation. Oops, what happened? Oh boy. Now I'm having a hard time going. Oh, there it is. Okay, <laughs> sorry for the technical difficulties here. Um, the Jang Cedar, this, we love the Jang Cedar. Um, this is, been a huge game changer for us. The greatest thing about the Jang is um, compared to other precision cedars is that it can work um, high organic matter soils like the ones we have here at Twitter Creek Gardens. Um, the settings can be set to match any seeding pattern that you want. So um, you set this thing to drop a seed every two inches and it's going to do that. And you can change the um, rollers that you use to the size seed that you're trying to plant. So for us, it was really important to find something that could plant our pelletized carrots effectively. We plant, um, <clears throat> excuse me, 50 rows of carrots. So that's five rows of carrot per bed, 10 beds of carrots, um, 50 rows in a, a pretty small space. So trying to go back and thin those by hand or even see those by hand would take a ton of time. So for us, the jank cedar was worth it just for our carrot crop, but the bonus is we get to plant all these other things with the jank cedar as well. And it does a really good job of spacing them um, to the correct spacing. Here's a series of stand-up cultivators that we use. Um, the bio disc, the, the wheel hoe and the tine weeding rake. We use these in addition to a standard stirrup hoe and a collinear hoe, and then we also do some hand weeding. But the goal with all of these stand-up cultivators is that you catch um, the, the weed seeds or the weed plants at a really young stage of growth. So if you can go through with a stand-up cultivator, you know, once a week and catch your <clears throat> weed seeds at a very, minimal growth, then these are gonna be super effective. Otherwise, you know, sometimes it happens for us, we'll wait three or four weeks because we just don't have the time. And we go back and we do this massive hand weeding that if we would have just went in, you know, a week after um, cultivating, or we cultivate every single week, then this would be a huge time saver. So the biodisker is great for established plants and cultivating between rows um, within a growing bed. The wheel hoe we use for all of our paths and that tine weeding rake is really effective um, for tightly spaced salad green mixes. So <clears throat> caterpillar tunnels, um, we just started using caterpillar tunnels a few years ago and we've been super happy with them. Um, two, or last winter actually, um, we lost, we finally lost our big, beautiful high tunnel to snow lows. It collapsed on us. I was diligently out there trying to remove snow day after day, but lost the battle. So I replaced that high tunnel with two caterpillar tunnels. And the great thing about these caterpillar tunnels is they're cheap are much cheaper than um, you know, regular high tunnels. And they're easy to install. Two of us can install one in you know, half to a full day. Um, we have to take the plastic off, so there's not gonna be any more danger of collapsing. And it captures the heat closer to the actual plants, which we found in the past are warmer loving plants um, appreciated having the warmth of the tunnels closer or the or, you know closer to the plant themselves. Um, and there's an easily easy ventilation system. So you can just scrunch up that plastic um, underneath the ropes and use those clips to hold it up. Do that in the morning of a hot day and at night you just have to, I can go down the line and kind of kick the plastic down with my foot and and boom, um, ventilation done. So the Quick Cuts Green Harvester is maybe the tool out of this list that's been the biggest game changer for us. Um, we specialize in salad mixes. So harvesting, washing, and um, packaging salad mixes is a major part of our farm time. And a snapshot of what this looks like for us in 2021, we harvested almost a ton of salad mixes. And if we break this down um, into just the actual act of harvesting by hand or with the quick cuts, um, that saves us more than a week for one employee. So uh, you can kind of see those charts there that give you an idea. And again, this tool easily paid for itself, um, not even in a season, really in like a week's time is 
pretty incredible. And you couple the quick cut screen harvester with the green spinner, the washing machine style green spinner. Um, and both of them together easily pay for themselves for us over the course of a season and save about three weeks uh, for one person, a three week cost of labor for one person. So we purchased one ready to use for $1,500 from Tin Bucket Farms. One of the other farmers here in Homer, uh, Carrie Rustino and her partner Craig from H Homer Hilltop did um, you know, a standard method to find an old washing machine, convert it just to a spin cycle and retrofit it. Um, so it could be a green spinner and she was generous enough to share kind of the outline of those costs and the time it took her to do that. So if you're mechanically inclined and adventurous, this is a totally great option to save some more money. Moving into our wash and pack house, we finally built one after years and years of desperately needing one. Um, we used to use pop-up tents that would blow away in the wind and we were always you know, spending so much time kind of messing with these janky setups. And finally, um, I got a farm service agency loan again to you know, help me build this wash and pack house. And it has just increased our efficiency tenfold and really made it available to harvest and wash and pack, you know, over 10 tons of produce, which is about what we're doing, um, about what we did in 2021. So for this purpose, I just wanted to highlight our walk-in cooler. Um, it's a simple box structure at the edge of our wash station. And this was a big game changer for us because we used to haul tote after tote of vegetables 50 feet across the driveway over to our root cellar, drop them down our hatch door. And then in the morning when we had to go to farmer's market, we'd have to haul them back out of the hatch door across the wood shop and into a delivery rig. And 50 feet, you know, doesn't sound like a lot, but when you have to haul all of these totes by hand, it adds up all of that time adds up so the fact that we can pack all of our produce and put it directly into our walk-in and then in the morning um, pull up to our delivery truck right to the walk-in because it borders our driveway and load up our truck that way it just saves a ton of time and saves us you know a lot of hard work on our body so we really appreciate it and the grant funds help pay for the air conditioning unit and the cool bot um, to run this so we just have an insulated box structure and the cool bot bypasses the air conditioning settings so you can keep um, our we can keep our walk-in cooler at refrigerator temperatures during our harvest season we keep those at uh, we keep the walk-in at about 38 degrees so all of our vegetables stay stay super fresh and it reduces the transpiration rate and we can deliver extremely fresh still living vegetables to our markets you know within 24 hours so if you're interested in seeing any more of these techniques um, as promised through the specialty crop block grant i did do a YouTube channel. So a lot of these are highlighted in more detail on our newly launched YouTube channel. So feel free to check that out if you want to. Um, we also with grant funds did a mini documentary kind of a story here at Twitter Creek Gardens. And when I'm done here, I'll just drop those links in the chat box. So if anybody wants to check them out, um, they'd be available to you. And the goal here is really to reach anybody in Alaska. So if that means you're um, a rural gardener or farmer and you don't have, you know, stable internet access or something, then just shoot me a line and I'll download any video that you're interested or in or any of this information and put it on a thumb drive and send it to you. So we really want to make it accessible to all Alaskans. That was the goal. And um, yeah, we're going to stick to it. If you have any other questions, get a hold of me. Um, there's our website, there's our email, and come visit us. We have an open gate policy on the farm. Anyone's welcome to come for a visit. Um, we can't promise that we'll be able to stop and take the time to give you a guided tour, but if we do have the time, we will, and we're certainly willing to, you know, answer questions while we're working the field. So I invite all of you, if you ever have the opportunity, to come for a visit. And I just want to give a super huge thank you to everyone that put this amazing conference together. I've been so incredibly inspired, moved to tears multiple times. I really appreciate all the indigenous wisdom and knowledge that is being shared and the emphasis on that throughout this conference. So 
Big cheers to our organizers. Um, a special thanks to the Division of Agriculture for the opportunity to have a specialty crop block grant and to be able to share that with all of you. A shout out to our videographer, Bjorn Olson of Majolner Film and Photography. And a big, huge thanks to all the farmers and gardeners and support agencies out there doing our best to feed and secure food for Alaskans and everything that goes into that. So huge thanks. Um, and thank you so much for having me. Cheers, everybody. Thank you, Emily. That was awesome. And I agree with Cindy Carnes 100% in the chat here. I'm proud that she's a superhero in my region. So um, we have a couple of minutes uh, or a minute before we take a break. If somebody wants to um, shout out a question to Emily, put you on the spot. a couple of questions in the chat. Um, one was about, um, was from Carl. Would you like to ask your question? Yeah, I can do, I think I think you can hear me better if I just do the yeah. voice. Perfect. Yeah, okay, well, well great. I. That was a great presentation, and I'm going to take you up on the open gate uh, policy you have. I, I really appreciate that. That's 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 a that's a challenge. I'm guessing uh, that uh, one one of the things I was just curious is what, what what are you germinating right now? What's in your starter? What's in your starter uh, uh, crop right now? Um, and then the uh, secondary is I thought I heard you had a restaurant too, which makes sense to me if you're doing value added for you know your products that you but maybe maybe i heard wrong so that those are a couple questions um yeah okay thanks carl so um we don't have a restaurant but we do deliver to restaurants so we service about eight restaurants um every week through the growing season and mostly what we're selling to restaurants are those specialty salad mixes that i mentioned um, right now I can look over, I'm sharing my house with my baby plants and I have hot peppers and tomatoes, um, herbs, and next up will be leeks and onions. And then we'll be able to move into our passive solar greenhouse in the end of March. And we really start our big brassica, um, starts in the beginning of April. So thanks for the questions. And I'll look through the chat and see if I can answer anybody else's questions if they're there. Yeah. When awesome. do you start the direct seed? That's the other question. The direct seed in, in your area. Um, I'll just answer that real quick, Kyra. I know we're out of time. Um, so I can get into my high tunnels usually in mid-April. Um, now that I don't have one, that I don't take the plastic off, I have to spread ash and cover um, our high tunnels with a little bit of snow on the ground. But I can direct seed high tunnels usually in mid-April, and then we normally can start direct seeding into the outdoor gardens in mid-May. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, well, it's time for your lunch break, everyone. So um, uh, this, you can take off and do whatever you'd like and meet us back here at 1215 for the keynote and more conversations. Thank you all for participating. Thanks for all you do.